Good evening. I am some even of the eventide. Welcome to Vampire Reviews. Oh, oh, right. <laughs> the giant spider pin is back and stuck on my fishnet gloves. The hazards of being a vampire maven. Stay. Be good. Recently, we discussed the first three books in the Cirque de Freak series, also known as the Saga of Darren Shan, written by Darren Shan. No relation. Or is there? Is that just what he wants us to think? So, last time we discussed this series of vampire children's books, I told you all about Darren Shan, the author, and why he writes, and how much he writes, and why his vampire stories have been so successful in connecting with children. If you haven't seen that video yet, go give it a watch. It's all right. We'll wait. Go on. You back? We good to go? All right. So, as I mentioned, this 12-book series is divided into four trilogies, sort of. The first three books weren't conceived as a trilogy, and each has its own new adventure for young Darren Shan, the little boy half-vampire, assistant to the vampire Mr. Krepsley at the traveling freak show called the Cirque du Freak. But those three ended up sort of serving as a prologue, a setup for a much larger, more complicated story arc developed in a more structured way through the rest of the series. Books four, five, and six aren't really a trilogy either, mainly because they're actually just one big book split into three parts. Books four and five each end abruptly on a cliffhanger with no resolution on any level. The author decided to chop it up this way because he thought shorter books would be easier for children to digest. Which is true. He says he was worried people would be mad about the cliffhangers, but they wound up not really getting any backlash at all, and his fans continued to devour them. In as far as structure goes, the three books split neatly and perfectly right at the Act 1 and Act 2 breaks that would naturally occur in a standardly formatted three-act novel. These three books are collectively called Vampire Rites. Act 1 is Vampire Mountain. Act 2 is Trials of Death, and Act 3 is The Vampire Prince. The tale begins when the vampire, Mr. Krepsley, tells his young half-vampire assistant, Darren, that the time has come for him to be presented before the vampire princes at Vampire Mountain. The bulk of the first book is their arduous journey to the mountain and their arrival at the Council of Vampire Generals, which only happens once every 12 years. Darren has been a half-vampire for 10 years now. Half-vampires still grow up, but very slowly, so even though he still looks like a little boy, inside he no longer feels much like a child. Since we never knew his exact age to start with, we can guess he's probably like 18 or 20 by now, on the inside. Well, still in the body of a, like, 10-year-old. So apparently, as it turns out, it's kind of against the rules to turn a kid into a vampire. Oops. And now the noble, honorable Mr. Krepsley is ready to face the music and accept punishment if the princes decide he deserves it for making Darren into his assistant. Why now, Darren's grown to like his boss, and he's accepted his vampire lifestyle, which was his main struggle in the first three books. As he puts it, I had a hard time adapting to the vampire and his ways, especially when it came to drinking human blood, but finally, I let go, accepting my situation, and got on with the business of living. So, Darren's now a bit upset when the princes decide that Mr. Krepsley has broken their laws and must be punished. Except they all still really like him, so they're not sure how. They really don't want to kill him, so they get the great idea to punish Darren instead. Brilliant! Since Darren's the illegal vampire here, they decide 
If he can prove his worth as a vampire by defeating a series of tests, the violent and terrifying trials of initiation, then Mr. Krepsley will be forgiven for turning a child. Yeah. Proving their worth means a lot to these vampires. We actually learn a whole lot more about vampire society and culture in these three books. And what we learn, well, it sure paints a picture. For example, vampires are peculiar creatures, someone tells Theron. They love a challenge. I knew one once who walked himself to death in sunlight merely because someone had sneered at him for only being able to come out at night. The journey to Vampire Mountain is a way of weeding out the weak from the strong. Vampires are ruthless in certain aspects. We do not believe in supporting those who are incapable of supporting themselves. From our point of view, it is better to lose one's life than lose one's pride. Darren points out how Mr. Krepsley spoke a lot about pride and nobility and being true to oneself. Life is a challenge, he tells Darren, and only those who rise to the challenge truly know what it means to live. There is a saying among vampires, maps are for humans. Most vampires would rather discover new territory for themselves, regardless of the dangers, than follow directions on a map. Once he's inside the mountain, Darren notices how there are hardly any older vampires. And vampires do still age, much more slowly than humans, but they do. So where are all the elderly ones? He is told, vampires live hard. We push ourselves to the limit, undergoing many tests of strength, wit, and courage. Hardly any sit around in pajamas and slippers growing old quietly. Most, when they grow too old to care for themselves, meet death on their feet, rather than let their friends look after them. When Darren's learning about vampire competitive sports and fighting, he's told they don't believe in protective clothing. They'd rather have their skulls cracked than wear helmets. When someone says there's nothing wonderful about losing an eye in a fight, a one-eyed vampire retorts, there is if you win, any injury is acceptable as long as you emerge victorious. These manly, manly vampires even see being clean and hygienic as not but for namby-pamby losers. Although vampires made sure they washed in the world of humans, a foul stench could lead a vampire hunter to his prey. Here, in the mountain, hardly any of them bothered with such luxuries. With all the soot and dirt of the halls, they didn't see the point. It was impossible to stay clean. They don't even have hot water in there. If you want to bathe, it's ice cold mountain springs for you. Man up or get out. Darren also notices that there are hardly any women vampires there at all. We only get one real female character in the whole book, unless you count his pet spider. When he asks her, where are all the ladies at? He's told the entire clan's barren. So the life doesn't appeal to many women. Yes, because women are the only people who care about being able to have children. Men are never into having descendants at all. Women and their baby fever. But for real, I can see why this lifestyle of hard-headed toxic masculinity wouldn't appeal to many women. As the author himself puts it on his website, I wanted Darren to meet a female vampire so that the question of why there are so few women vampires could be naturally raised. Answer, because the clan is packed with very old male chauvinists. Interesting tangent. Sorry, this is kind of off topic, but I have to share with you what else the author said on his website about the no women question. I loosely based the vampire clan on real warrior tribes of the past and present, like the Celts, the Samurai, the Maasai Mara, and then try to imagine how such a society would evolve if the members lived for hundreds of years. Because the vampires don't mix much with humans, and since there were so few women among their ranks, it made sense to me that homosexuality would be quite common in the clan, as it was among many tight-knit groups of soldiers in the past, the ancient Romans, Greeks, Spartans, etc. I was going to mention this in Vampire Mountain. I even had the idea that there would be little love caves where the guys could go to get away from the hustle and bustle for a while. 
but I knew my publishers would hit the roof and demand it be written out as they work themselves up into a state if I include any kind of sexual references, be they heterosexual or homosexual or anywhere in between. So I reined in my anthropological observations and kept quiet. Ah, oh, that would have been awesome. But the way it ended up works better with what he's setting up here about vampire society. These vampires would probably think the love caves were for losers with feelings. These vampires are men who prove themselves with the size of their muscles. During the great battle in the climax of act three, the one, one female vampire is fighting a bad guy. And he's like, so the vampires send women to do their fighting now. Ew. And she tells him, women are all you are fit to face. You are not worthy of facing men and dying with honor. Imagine the disgrace when the word spreads that you perished at the hands of a woman. Even this poor lady, who the author claims in an interview is a female character who makes Xena look like Shirley Temple, even she is still full of the internalized misogyny of her vampire culture, seeing herself as less worthy than the men despite how she's one of their greatest fighters because of how hard she's worked to prove herself. This is the traditional way of the vampire. The way their kind has lived for centuries and centuries. And in this, the vampire is serving as a commentary on the toxicity of traditional values and patriarchal social structures as they have existed in the real world. But. Some vampires don't think this way is the best for the future and want to change things. Slightly more than half of the vampires, actually, just enough to elect by majority a new vampire prince who's about to take office soon. This is Curtis Smolt, and he's got some wild ideas. Like that maybe they should rule with their brains and not their brawn. And that maybe, just maybe, peace and compromise and negotiation would be better tactics than always resolving issues with ruthless battles to the death. Kurda tells Darren, every other prince has muscles the size of bowling balls. The princes have always been the biggest, toughest, bravest vampires. I'm the first to be nominated because of my brain. The first ever in the entire history of vampire society. He goes on to say, I think the nobility of the vampires is misplaced. The old and infirm often have much to offer, and I personally hope to cling to life as long as possible, but most vampires hold to the ancient belief that they can only lead worthwhile lives as long as they are fit enough to fend for themselves. In your heart is where a man should judge himself, he says to Darren not on the bars or in a ring or in a battlefield. If you know in your heart that you're true and brave, that should be enough. One of the most important traits to vampire society is sheer blind loyalty. But Kurda questions that. Do we have to obey the princes even when they're wrong? Even when they rule unjustly? Ways can be changed. The princes are too inflexible. They ignore the fact that the world is moving forward. And He's got a point, especially in light of the fact that a certain terrible prophecy is about to come true. Oh yes, there is a prophecy. So as we learned in book three of the series, there's a different faction of vampire called the Vampanese. Vampires need to drink human blood to live, but they never kill their victims. The Vampanese do. They believe it's disrespectful and dishonorable to treat humans like blood donors, and killing them is more noble to them. So the vampires and the vampanese have kind of been enemies for centuries, but exist in a tense truce and largely don't bother each other. The prophecy says that a mysterious vampanese lord will rise to power, and when he does, all the vampires will be wiped out. The only chance the vampires will have to survive is if they can protect and keep their magic talisman, the Stone of Blood. If they can do this, most of them will still die, but not all, and they might maybe have a chance to rebuild. But Kurda doesn't like those odds. He's like, why can't we just make actual peace with the Vampanese and bring our two clans together? 
we could compromise with them about the fact that they kill people and the other stuff about their lives that we don't like, and they could agree not to annihilate us, everybody wins. And enough other vampires think this kind of sounds like a good plan to have voted for him to become a prince. But the rest of the princes and the vampires are like, nah, no compromise, only fight. And Muscles, our pride is too great to ever join with the Vampanese. Young Darren is pretty much on Curta's side here. Curta treats him like a friend and takes care of Darren when some other vampires would let him sink or swim despite him being in the body of a child. There must be no exceptions, they tell poor, small, untrained, inexperienced Darren who's about to face the trials of initiation, which many full-fledged vampires cannot complete. A vampire who cannot pull his own weight is of no use to us. We have no place for children who need to be wet-nursed and tucked into their coffins at daybreak. But curta has got Darren's back. All of the middle book of the trilogy is Darren going through the excruciatingly brutal trials of initiation. If he passes them, he'll prove he's worthy of being a vampire, and Mr. Crest plays off the hook. If he fails them, he dies. And these are children's books. Trials of death. Baby's first torture porn. And by the end of it, Darren is in horrible shape. His body mangled and ruined. During the last trial we get to witness in vicious, gory detail, he's run out of steam. And he's about to really die this time when one of his friends jumps in to help him. But this is against the rules. And even though Darren saved in the moment, he now must be executed for failing to defeat the trials alone. No one wants to execute poor little brave Darren, but it is the vampire way. And ways cannot change. So before he can be executed, Curta helps Darren escape because he's like, screw you guys, ways can change. But as they're sneaking out through the tunnels of Vampire Mountain, Darren discovers that Curta is hiding a bunch of Vampanese down there and plans to completely overthrow the vampires and kill the other princes as soon as he becomes prince. And Darren's like, oh, betrayal. And Curta's like, yeah, but it's the only way we can save our people. The other princes will never change. And Darren's like, no, screw you, and throws himself over a waterfall to certain death. You don't know a thing about honor or loyalty. I'd rather die than give myself up to scum like you. A very vampire attitude of you there, Darren. But as book three of this set reveals, he doesn't die. He miraculously manages to survive after being washed out of the mountain and freezing and broken and starving. He is rescued by this pack of wolves who he'd previously befriended in act one. As the wolves nurse him back to health, Darren observes their pack dynamics and he can't help comparing it to the vampire way. When he sees one wolf lose a fight to another, he's surprised that the loser remains a member of the pack. I thought about that a lot over the next day or two, comparing the way the wolves handled their losers to how vampires handled theirs. In the world of vampires, defeat was a disgrace, and more often than not ended with the death of the defeated. Wolves were more understanding. Honor mattered to them, but they wouldn't kill or shun a member of their pack just because it had lost face. Young wolf cubs had to endure tests of maturity, just as I'd endured the trials of initiation. But they weren't killed if they failed. Vampires could learn a thing or two from wolves if they took the time to study their ways. It was possible to be both honorable and practical. Curta, for all his treacherous faults, got that much right at least. Also, there's this old grandma wolf in the pack who clearly can't take care of herself. But instead of leaving her behind to die as the vampires would with their elderly, the wolves help her as part of their family. And then when Darren needs help getting back inside the vampire mountain because he's healed and ready to go try warn everyone about Curta's betrayal, it turns out that this grandma wolf is the only one old enough to remember a secret way in. See, the old and infirm can be useful even if they can't pull their own weight. 
You know how I feel about wolves, but the vampires in the story are a metaphor for societal systems and standards that remain inflexible past their purpose due to stubbornness, pride, chauvinism, insecurity, and other toxic traits detrimental to progress and inclusivity. And it takes the eyes of a child thrust into the heart of feral nature to make everyone realize that change can be good. If the wolves can live this way, why can't the vampires? After all, wolves are still badass, right? Not namby-pamby losers at all. So, when Darren gets back into the mountain, he reveals himself to the princes, even though he knows it means he'll be executed, but he does it in time to stop Curta's betrayal plan. Then, all the vampires go together to kill the vampanese hiding in the mountain, and this is the climactic final battle of the story. Darren may not have muscles the size of bowling balls, but he uses his wits and the lessons he's learned along the way to play a crucial role in saving the day. He's found the right combination between the old values of pride and loyalty, as well as the new ideas of change and progress. During the battle, Darren kills a person for the first time, and it shakes him deeply. He has a bit of an existential crisis and comes out of it with a wiser and darker heart. That thing he heard earlier in the story that was like, any injury is acceptable as long as you emerge victorious. Well, it's just not true. The lives lost in this war, the injury of the people are not worth the pride of winning the battle. None of this slaughter was necessary. Kurda's idea of compromise probably could have happened and saved lives if anyone had just listened to him. And Darren is sick at heart. No matter how I looked at it, he says, I couldn't help thinking that Kurda had been both a hero and a villain. Things would be simpler if he was one or the other, but I couldn't pigeonhole him. It was just too complicated. Curta wanted to prevent the destruction of the vampires. To that end, he'd betrayed them. Was he evil for doing so? Or would it have been worse to act nobly and let his people perish? Should you stay true to your friends, whatever the consequences? I found it impossible to decide. Part of me hated Curta and believed he deserved to be killed. Another part remembered his good intentions and amiable manner and wished there'd been some other way of punishing him short of execution. But Curta is executed. His plan failed, and it seems there is now no way to stop the prophecy of the evil Vampanese lord who is yet to come and destroy all of vampire kind. But Darren isn't even sure if he'll live long enough to see that terrible day. See, he still has a death sentence for failing to finish the Trials of Initiation, even despite all the other ways he's proven he's worthy of being a vampire. Their rules, the vampire way, are just so inflexible that they all still believe they have to kill him for failing the Trials. But wait, someone finds a loophole. For a book series that's usually so tragic and so torturous, where the main message is, life sucks, Growing up sucks. Real life doesn't have a storybook ending. You just have to deal with it. The author finally throws us a bone. The vampires figure out that they can stay Darren's execution if, and only if, he has a certain title that placed him above the rules. So, unanimously, all these stodgy old vampires who have never wanted change or progress in all their centuries make this kid, with all his complicated ideas, the new Vampire Prince, because they have seen the value in what he has to offer. And we can expect that young half-vampire Darren will be ruling with his mind instead of his muscles. He's already getting the other princes to think about their future differently. For centuries, they say, we vampires have stuck by our old ways and traditions and looked on amused as humanity changed and evolved, growing ever more fractured. While the humans of this planet have lost their sense of direction and purpose, our belief in ourselves has never wavered. Until recently. It is a sign of the time. Treachery is nothing new to mankind, but this is our first real taste of it. While we have no plans to abandon our ways outright, we must face the future and adapt as required. We have been living in a world of absolutes, but this is no longer the case. 
we must open our eyes, ears, and hearts to new ways of thinking and living. Good for you guys! And if these ruthless vampires in this extremely backwards society can embrace this change, then maybe, maybe there's hope for the rest of us in the real world too. I don't know, you guys, it's 2021, new year, new administration, dare we hope? I'm the maven of the eventide and look to the vampires to guide you. video review of books four, five, and six in the saga of Darren Shan was requested by one of my Patreon patrons. Thank you so much for sponsoring this video. Yes, there are still more, six more books in this series. If you'd like to suggest or request future vampire reviews, come on and join my Patreon. I cannot promise that I will not use the money to buy more spiders. Let go. Let go. All right, it's your glove now.